Good afternoon. No. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to yet another exciting Center for Japanese Studies noon lecture. <laughs> um, I'm uh, Tomi Tonomura, and I am. I have the privilege of introducing today's speaker, uh, Professor Eric C. Rath, um, whom I welcome. Uh, I welcomed him in September. I welcome him again as the Toyota visiting professor uh, uh, in residence for the whole year. Um, it's actually welcome him back because he received uh, his PhD in history, pre-modern Japanese history in 1998. Um, and then uh, he quickly received the uh, Rice Shower, the Rice Shower uh, postdoc fellowship at, the, at Harvard University. And he did that one year, um, and he was immediately hired by the University of Kansas, and uh, he has been there since uh, 1999. Um, in the meantime, he's published lots and lots and lots of fascinating articles and books and received some awards and so on, but I would like to mention the books that, that uh, were published recently, um, the uh, book, that came out from University of California Press is called Food and Fantasy in Early Modern Japan. Another one uh, that was in 2010. Another one uh, published by University of Illinois Press in the same year uh, is called Japanese Foodways, Past and Present. Uh, his uh, dissertation actually uh, was published as uh, um, um, published by um, Harvard um, East Asia Center, and that one was called The Ethos of No, Actors and Their Art. He actually started his uh, uh, academic career um, uh, studying no, um, not, and he is also a no performer. I don't know if he is or he was, but he, he is very talented in so many ways, so you can ask him to show off some of his multi-talent sometime. Maybe give him some beer first. I think that might work better. <laughs> and I also want to mention some other titles of his articles and so on, because they are just a lot of fun. Um, so generally, you can see that he moved from no and kyogen, et cetera, and tea ceremony to food. Um, there's some connection there. But uh, one called The Magic of Japanese Rice Cakes, uh, New Meanings for Old Vegetables in Kyoto, uh, Iemoto and the Family Head System, uh, The Tastiest Dish in Edo, Print, Performance, and Culinary Entertainment in Early Modern Japan. Uh, then there's an article about Rikyu and his kaiseki um, and the origins of Japanese cuisine. Um, how intangible is Japan's traditional dietary culture? That's a big question. Uh, meal time at a Tibet, Tibetan monastery. This is because he went to Tibet. He had a big project uh, uh, do, doing um, uh, food, food ways in Tibet and kind of comparative uh, stuff. Um, and there is one that I like, Banquets Against Boredom, Towards Understanding Cuisine, Samurai Cuisine in Early Modern Japan. Um, and then, uh, this is a more uh, modernistic one, Godzilla meets Super Kyogen, or how a dinosaur's debut on the classical Kyogen stage saved the world. Now, it's a big, big question. Okay, so I'll stop here. There are others, but I hope you look up some of these articles. Uh, they are really interesting. Um, Okay, so we can begin uh, the, uh, uh, we, can, we can ask Eric to come here. Uh, the title of the talk is up there, but I have been asked to uh, make an announcement. Okay, so this, so this is the announcement. This is the last program in our fall 2017 CJS Thursday lecture series. Please join us for the start of the winter 2018 CJS Thursday lecture series with David Howell. Um, professor of Japanese history and chair of the Department of East Asian Language and Service at Harvard University, and editor, that's a very long, uh, editor of the Harvard Journal of Asiatic Studies. He will be lecturing on the economy of fear in 19th century Japan. And another, there are two more things to say. One is to please uh, ask for microphone when you want to do your question uh, in the Q&A uh, session. And one more thing, finally, is that Eric will be teaching a course, a History of Sushi, uh, 
It's overbooked now already, so if you didn't register, uh, you just have to go on the wait list. It's already a very popular course. So please uh, help me welcome Professor Eric Rath. Am I on? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. All right, good. So what do I do with this? You can keep that, I think. I keep this? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you'll have a question. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Tommy. Oh, and, and thank you all. It's such a great pleasure, such a great honor to be here as a Toyota visiting professor, coming back to Michigan, feeling like a graduate student again, and being with people I learned from, Professor Tonomura. Professor Leslie Pincus, Professor Jennifer Robertson, and others. And everybody in the Center for Japanese Studies has been so kind and gracious and welcoming. Uh, the director, Kiyo, uh, Shinobu, Leah, Yuri-san, Barbara, Brad, all the student assistants, uh, thank you for making me feel so welcome. It's just great to be here. And it's just so exciting, too, to be with a really engaged student environment, really engaged students. Um, I, I think about this every time I cross the Diag because I get a handed a leaflet. <laughs> and that has never happened in 17 years at the University of Kansas that I'll get a leaflet. I have a whole drawer full of the copies of the New Testament, but never a leaflet. So I'm just appreciative of that as well. Asked what survives from Japan's early modern period, one might point to traditional foods and beverages as the most conspicuous legacies because these commodities are now available worldwide. Sushi rolls, maki sushi, and the nigiri sushi of sliced fish on rice, both of which had their origin in early modern Japan, are now enjoyed in American ballparks and university cafeterias. Tempura, the fried vegetable and shrimp dish, which is another mainstay of Japanese restaurants globally, originated as an Iberian import in the late 16th century, but took on its characteristic form in the 18th century. The Portuguese and Spanish merchants who introduced tempura to Japan also taught the Japanese how to cook with sugar, which became a lucrative import item for foreign merchants and an important domestic product for Satsuma Domain in Kyushu, which controlled sugar production on the island of Amamiyoshima southwest of Kyushu. Iberians introduced recipes for hard and soft candies, cakes, cookies, and Japanese cooks soon added sugar into existing savory snacks like rice cakes and stuffed buns, transforming these into sweets. By the late 1600s, rice flour dough, refined sugar, pulverized azuki beans, and coloring that are the DNA for Japanese confectionery took shape into the familiar cornucopia of traditional sweets used to celebrate the change of seasons and holidays. And for my part, these are the things that make kneeling in a tea room bearable. <laughs> Sake, the traditional alcoholic beverage often served to accompany or precede the consumption of these foods was vastly improved in the early modern period to the point that modern versions of sake depend on brewing techniques refined in the 18th and 19th centuries. Nicotine was introduced through tobacco to Japan in the 1570s. Smoking, smoking quickly attained prominence in the early modern period, creating a foundation for Japan's modern tobacco culture. But as much as one can assert historical continuities, between the commodities available within and outside of Japan today, the contrasts are equally as apparent. Sushi is sourced globally today, even though it still might be called fresh from Edo, Edo Mai. Apart from a few craft brewers, most of the sake made in Japan follows a scientific process that calls for the introduction of lactic acid to replace the arduous task of stirring the mash, as well as the introduction of distilled alcohol to adjust the taste and to lower the cost of production. In the early modern period, leading doctors such as Otsuki Gentaku 
and intellectuals, including Motori Norinaga, talked about the health benefits of smoking. But even heavy smokers today would scoff at the very idea that tobacco was advantageous to the body or to the pocketbook. So beyond the histories of these commodities, the fascination with food in popular culture in the early modern period remains as strong as ever in Japan today. Food became an object of playful absorption in popular culture in the early modern period, at the same time that Japan's high cuisine was codified in hundreds of published cookbooks. My talk describes how food, beverages, and tobacco proved their entertainment value to commoners in the early modern period as the focal points of struggles ranging from eating and drinking contests to fantasy battles in which brands of sake fought different sweets or blends of tobacco. Such depictions were metaphors for the keen competition for customers among purveyors of these goods, which also captured audiences' attention. The foodstuffs, drinks, and drugs depicted in the writings about various gustatory competitions described in my talk are all quintessentially early modern. In terms of its popularity and centrality to daily life, buckwheat noodles, soba, was the early modern equivalent to ramen, Japan's most famous noodle dish today, and one called Chinese soba through the first half of the 20th century. Like soba, the popularity of sake and sweets rested on technical innovations that made these goods more widely available from the 17th century, when smoking in Japan was too popular for the government to prohibit. Reporting on these battles of comestible, comestibles were early modern Japan's equivalent of food bloggers, fans who wrote copiously about their favorite items to ingest. Visual artists incorporated motifs from confectionery and beverage cultures in surprising ways to entertain. Poets wrote odes to their favorite blend of tobacco or noodle dish, while comic novelists went so far as to make their beloved vices of sake and tobacco the anthropomorphized stars of the early modern versions of comic books. Collectively, the evidence of gustatory competitions suggests a level of fun with food, drink, and tobacco that rivals the prominence of these goods in modern Japanese culture. But the main difference is that early modern culinary discourse was created by and for men. And it catered to masculine sensibilities that cast foods in settings like battlefields and sumo matches where women were rarely visible. In other words, fun with food in Japan was constructed as a largely a male pleasure. Great picture. In 2001, competitive eater Kobayashi Takeru won the Nathan's Coney Island hot dog eating contest, consuming 50 hot dogs in 12 minutes, twice the amount of the previous record. Born in Nagano, Japan, in 1978, Kobayashi went on to win the same contest five more times in a row. But if you've been following this, as of 2017, Joey Jaws Chestnut is the current record holder. 73.5 hot dogs in 10 minutes. But our man Kobayashi has eaten more cow brains, 17.7 pounds in 15 minutes of cow brains, more lobster rolls, 41 in 10 minutes, and more rice balls, 20 pounds in 30 minutes than anyone else in the world today. Kobayashi's achievements might seem an aberration to Japanese food culture, famous for its small servings, particularly at sushi restaurants. But he would have faced some tough competition in early modern Japan. A contest in 1817 at the restaurant Manpachiro, located in Ryogoku in Edo, which is the site of uh, the National Sumo Hall today, that contest featured separate events for beverages and food as described by writer writer Kaido Ansakishiryo in an account in Tales of the Rabbit Garden, 
edited by novelist Kyokute Bakin. At this contest, Sakaya Chuzo, a 68-year-old man from Odawara, downed 1.44 gallons of sake. <laughs> but his competitor, half his age, drank more than twice as much and probably fell over and passed out. <laughs> Other contestants displayed their fortitude eating sweets. A 56-year-old man from Kanda in Edo, Maruya Kanemon, ate 50 stuffed buns, seven cakes of the gelatinous azuki bean sweet yokan, and 30 specially rice cakes washed down with 19 bowls of tea. The author who recorded the event speculated, quote, the people who are great eaters of a lot of food must have extraordinary digestive tracts. A drinking contest two years earlier in Senju in Edo captured the attention of many cultural figures, including the comic author Ota Nanpo, the visual artists Tani Buncho and Kano Sosen, and the poet Okubo Shibitsu, all of whom depicted the 1815 event in their respective media. This so-called Senju Great Sake Meeting was in celebration of the 60th birthday of the wholesaler Nakaya Rokuemon. Ota called his account the Ladder Duck to Water Chronicle. Borrowing a title from the Duck to Water Chronicle, an illustrated depiction of a drinking bout in 1649 by the artist Hishikawa Morinobu. Now, ducks, that's a clever reference to the Chinese character for sake. I get to use the pointer now. Oh. Kind of got smushed, but you can see sake right there. Because sake is composed of the elements of water and bird, thus making waterfall synonymous with alcohol. According to Ota, approximately 100 people participated in this senju contest. They bought tickets that designated the amount of sake that they wanted to consume. Contestants could choose from six different size cups, each with a name suggesting enormity. The smallest, called Enoshima, was named for a scenic island near Kamakura. It had a capacity of a little over 30 ounces. The largest cup was the red crested crane, and it held 1.44 gallons. A 62-year-old resident of Shin Yoshiwara in Edo drank the equivalent of that large cup and an additional 30 ounces. But the winner finished all six cups, downing approximately 4.3 gallons of sake. A few women hired to serve the sake also joined in the context, one of whom drank 30 ounces and another imbibed 42 ounces. Uh, if you look back at medieval diaries, you can see that excessive drinking and the results vomiting were acceptable behavior at banquets among the aristocratic and warrior elite in the Muromachi period, 1336 to 1573. In the Edo period, the media made binge drinking into a spectator sport for commoners. Besides Tani Buncho's and Kano Sosen's paintings of this contest in Senju, Confuci Confucian scholar Ichikawa Kansai depicted the competition in his picture scroll, Illustrated Drinking Contest. And if you couldn't afford these, you could buy the equivalent of a newspaper page called a broadsheet, and that would list all the participants and how much they drank. Some 60 years before these two contests, Nishinsha Yukyoshi recounted a soba sumo between his two friends, Tanimura and Hiraoka. As he recorded in his manuscript Encyclopedia of Soba, dated 1751, Nishinsha served each contestant a small mountain of homemade soba, approximately three pounds of buckwheat noodles. A crowd gathered to watch. When both contestants consumed all the soba, the audience was stunned. Asked if he could still eat more, Tanamura replied he could have two or three more servings. Nishinsha wrote, Quote, they ate one serving, then a second serving, ultimately consuming 21 servings. 
he continued. Everyone, was, everyone watching was surprised and amazed and even more amused, wondering how they could have eaten that much. People shouted, you better stop serving them any more soba. Because of this, the two of them said, of course, we ate more than we expected, and we cannot eat any more. Thus, there was neither winner nor loser for the soba sumo, and a tie was declared, which made everyone highly agitated. One person said to Hiroka, you've always had a great appetite. Can you eat still more than this? Just then, a, gris, a dish of grain and fava beans appeared. Someone asked them, how about this? Hiroka said, oh, this is something different. I'll eat it. And he polished off two large servings. Now, Hiroka's triumph sparked a heated discussion about whether he was now the victor in the match. But the crowd ultimately decided that a dish of fava beans and grain was not relevant to a contest of eating soba. So the sumo match remained a tie. The author's aim in writing about the eating contest was partly to record a spectacle focused on buckwheat noodles, a topic so close to his heart that he chose the pen name Soba Lover. But his description of the Soba Sumo match was also a cautionary tale. He explained that Hiroka, a contestant with a, quote, frighteningly large stomach, who ate the two servings of grain with fava beans, suffered from a gastric disorder a few years later, and he died. His opponent, Tanimura, who ate only soba, was not only healthy, but also lived to his 70s and still enjoyed buckwheat noodles. This outcome confirmed to Nishinsha, the author, that eating soba, even in large amounts, caused no health problems. The author, Nishinsha, lacked the scientific knowledge to correlate buckwheat's high fiber content and its low digestibility, but he provided every detail he could muster about the grain in his soba encyclopedia. The text never saw publication in the early modern period, and I would attribute that fact that it's very discursively written. It drifts from topic to topic in a three-volume work, and it is very reminiscent of a modern food blog in terms of its stream of consciousness approach to organization and idiosyncratic focus on a subject dear to the author's heart. The author lists the famous locations where buckwheat is grown, providing a connoisseur's guide to various varieties, such as the renowned Jindaiji Soba, produced on the grounds of a temple precinct 37 miles from Edo. He weighs in on the proper thickness of soba noodles, the correct temperature for the water to prepare the flour, where to purchase the best flour to make noodles and the right toppings to use. Soba sumo was only one type of noodle competition described in his soba encyclopedia. The author also details the rise and fall of various noodle shops in the style of a modern restaurant reviewer, revealing how these establishments competed for customers. He recalls how in his youth, a shop in Asakusa called Yoshida was famous for its soba. But the establishing, establishment operating by the same name today was just not as good. Likewise, the store Yoshikawaya in Horie Machi became famous for using kudzu all the way from Yoshino, modern Nara prefecture, to thicken its noodles. But that establishment had since closed. Another shop in the same locale specialized in red utensil soba. But the serving size was so small, they went out of business. Another eatery called Sakaya in Izumimachi specialized in takeout soba. And it became very popular among samurai and townspeople for its dish called the Immortals of Poetry Soba. This was served in black lacquer, and it contained verses written by kabuki actors. People loved this so much, they never returned the containers. <laughs> the taste of the noodles, though, was what was most important from the author. And he critiqued that establishment, saying that their noodles were bad when you ate them there, and they were worse when you took them out. He also reveals how Sobo is a focus for local pride and regional rivalry. He wrote, quote, today everyone in society 
regardless of high and low station, enjoys the taste of soba. People in parts of the northern area of Japan arm wrestle in challenges over the local pride in making soba. But for the author Nishinsha, the best soba was in Edo. People in the southwest also make soba, but it tastes bad. Recently, people have started to make it in Kyoto, and this soba has entered into the ranks of the somewhat tasty. However, the noodles are not as good, and the daikon topping is not spicy. Therefore, it cannot be compared to the delicious taste of Edo. Nishinsho would be happy to know that even though his home city was renamed Tokyo, the close association between Edo and soba remains a frequent topic discussed in internet writings, graphic novels with culinary themes, and popular nonfiction. In his period, Nishinsho was not alone in his noodle obsession. Though his manuscript was never published, he imagined that his work would resonate with other soba lovers, as he explained in the postscript to Soba Encyclopedia. He writes, quote, I have loved soba since childhood, and for many years I have eaten soba from soba makers and homemade soba, but I have been unable to fully understand soba. Recently I have tried to prepare soba at home using a variety of methods. I feel that I have plumbed the depths of homemade soba. Consequently, I have written in a rather discursive style the things I have observed long ago and more recently of my test results. For the ordinary people today who love soba, I thought I would just share this work. Eighty, eighty years later, another soba lover, Yamazaki Eizan, wrote, uh, wrote Soba Road Diary. It's an account of multiple trips from Edo up the major roads of the Tokaido and the Nakasendo that focuses entirely on the noodle shops on these routes. Yamazaki listed the types of soba sold in these eateries, and he added a poem on the theme of soba of his own creation or by other authors. On the Tokaido at Fujisawa Station, which is a coastal city in modern Kanagawa Prefecture, he recorded that tempura is served with green soba, its green color perhaps from the herb mugwort used often in Japanese cooking. This dish inspired the following poem. Stone and green color, the tempura soba of Fujisawa is served best, garnished with spice. Now, in my classical Japanese class at the University of Michigan here, taught by Robert Danley, he told us we always had to repeat a poem twice. So I'll give it to you one more time, because it's a gem, isn't it? <laughs> Stone and green color, the tempura soba of Fujisawa is served best, garnished with spice. Yamazaki's poetic musings on soba and his records of noted establishments apparently found popularity among a coterie of readers who shared his passion. While his work was never published, numerous copies of his manuscript survive. Hmm? There we go. Such obsessions may be too esoteric for people who do not share these passions for noodles. But soba was arguably one of the most familiar prepared foods for sale in 19th century Edo. One 1811 survey of eating establishments in the warrior capital lists 718 shops selling wheat noodles, udon, or soba. And that accounted for almost 10% of the city's eateries and confectioners. Five decades later, the number of soba shops grew by more than five times to number 3,763 establishments. Enough so that there'd be a soba shop on every, in every neighborhood. By that time, an additional 900 soba peddlers plied their trade on popular thoroughfares, making available a late night meal or snack for revelers or workers. Other soba shops opened early to offer breakfast to laborers on their way to their job site. Now I'm gonna just digress a second and talk a little bit about uh, 
the SOBA. Uh, in case you're wondering about the history of SOBA, maybe you, some of you know this, maybe some of you don't. Uh, when does SOBA arrive in Japan? Well, it's clear that SOBA pollen dates to the Jomon period. So that would be sometime between, between the first and, before the first and second millennia before Common Era. So the pollen's there. Uh, we have records of its cultivation in the 8th century when it's planted as a survival food. And the benefits of soba is that you can plant it in upland slopes where you couldn't plant rice. However, uh, it was hard to eat soba as a grain, and it wasn't until the 1300s with the arrival of a stone mortar to take that grain and make a nice flour that soba became more widely consumed. And indeed, the first time we see a reference to a soba noodle is the word soba kiri around 1574. A lot of different types of soba you might see on the shelves today. And one of the ways of differentiating types of soba is by the amount of flour that's used. Because soba has very low gluten and it's very difficult to work, it's just pure soba. So people tend to add wheat flour and that might determine uh, the type of soba that you're buying, but also how finely that soba grain is polished. And I think if you polish that grain down to something like 17%, in other words, you've milled away uh, almost 80% of the grain, you're left with a very white, starchy core that's used for sarashina soba. Oh, here's our little mortar. These, incidentally, introduced in the 1300s, but not widely available among farm people in rural areas until the 17th century, until this period that I'm talking about today. Uh, recipes for soba, the Soba Encyclopedia has these two popular recipes for soba, for drenched soba, soba in a broth, and colander or zaru soba, soba served as it is. Also, that same book and others, including the first cookbook, uh, The Tales of Cookery, Yori Monogatari, which dates from 1643, has a uh, sauce that you could use for your soba that's just like the sauce that you would make for soba today. Uh, you make a nice uh, broth using kombu, using skipjack tuna flakes, you flavor it with wasabi, with green onions, uh, with red pepper. Sounds just like something we might cook up today. So back to my talk. For about a quarter the cost of a bowl of soba Commoners in Edo could purchase and enjoy another type of culinary battle printed on parody sumo fight cards, mitate banzuke. Parody sumo fight cards were broadsheets about the size of a modern newspaper page that used the popular way of visually ranking sumo wrestlers as a means to envision imagined contests between inanimate objects, replacing the roster of wrestlers' names with lists of other articles, such as foods. Wrestlers, or objects of the highest rank, appear in the largest type at the top of the page, in two opposing columns, with fighters from lesser classes printed in ever smaller fonts beneath them. One version printed around the 1830s is Sumo Program of Economical Everyday Cooking Methods. It features a match between seafood recipes and vegetarian dishes. Leading the seafood side were three dishes. Dried salted sardines, simmered shellfish with dried daikon, and roasted shrimp. Facing the top fish dishes were the vegetarian options of boiled tofu, fried tofu simmered with kombu seaweed, and fried strips of burdock. Referee in the imagined contest were several varieties of pickles, which are the indispensable accompaniment for any meal. Oh, that was showing the more slide. Ah, here's our contest. Oh, keep doing that. So here are our referees, the pickles. Uh, this is the vegetable side, vegetable sumo wrestlers, and the uh, top uh, west side is the seafood wrestlers. All total. The Sumo Program of Economical Everyday Cooking Methods lists some 212 dishes drawn from the repertoire of the ordinary fare of commoners. It's not the haute cuisine of the elite. By placing food in an outlandish but somewhat familiar context, 
the array of recipes on Sumo program of cooking, of economical everyday cooking methods, this bonzake offered the chance to peruse a variety of foods simultaneously. These are the foods that the commoners uh, who were the audience of such works could experience in their daily lives only one at a time. So to see them all at once, I think, was rather entertaining, especially in this context. These parody sumo fight cards placed food in a fantastic context of competition and struggle. But the famous woodblock print artist, Utegawa Hiroshige, imagined what would happen if food and drink actually came to life to do battle. Hiroshige is famous for his landscapes, but his triptych prints, peace, joy, and the price war between sake and sweets, produced between 1843 and 1846, offers a, both a play on words recalling the famous 14th century war tale, the Chronicle of Great Peace, the Taiheki, and it's a scene of utter gastronomic mayhem with personified versions of noted sweets fighting famous brands of sake. The host of confections is arrayed on the left panel of the triptych with a sake army occupying the right. Heroes from each side meet for battle in the center panel. Labels and heraldry help the viewer decipher the context. A white banner for the sake brewer Kenbishi flutters in the top right corner. It's evident from its design, which looks like an exclamation point, but actually depicts a sword, a ken, above a water chestnut, hishi. Prominent among our sake warriors is the red-faced sake cup, whose body is made of containers for serving and storing the beverage. Other types of sake that appear include the brands Otokoyama and Kamiya from Itami, sake infused with iris, which is something you drink as a tonic in the fifth day of the fifth month. We have unfiltered sake, nigore sake, and sake made only from polished rice, moruhaku. Cheap sake and sake for flower viewing parties also make an appearance. The sweets in Hiroshige's print are both warriors and weapons. The confectionery samurai wielding the large pole that looks like a candy cane up there is an anthropomorphized conglomeration of treats and cooking utensils. His head is a giant steamed bun of uncertain filling. He is armored around the torso with a box for steaming sweets with protective flats flaps at the waist made from wrapping paper. Other sweets appearing or announced by signage include varieties of rice cakes, stuffed buns, candies, and the fluffy Castilian cake, kasutera, a legacy of Iberian influence on the traditional Japanese confectionery repertoire. The variety of sweets reflects the number of confectioners operating in Edo, almost four times the number of soba shops according to the 1811 survey I mentioned earlier. That survey further designated sweet shops according to their specialties. And these include dumplings and broth, candies, sweets made from rice flour, or rice cakes, ca crackers, and other goodies. So I'm just going to step aside now and, and, and break from my talk and talk a little bit about a subject dear to my heart, sake and say, why is it that uh, Edo period is such a booming time, important time for understanding sake? Well, it's in this period that uh, sake brewing really improved for three basic reasons. First of all, only using polished rice for the whole process. No brown rice at all. Second of all, brewing only in the wintertime, which helps to reduce the chance that the sake might get infected by some foreign microbe or something like that, and also allows for a slower fermentation, and that improves the taste of the sake. Also, the final thing is that the sake brewers learned that they could maintain the alcohol content of the sake and produce larger amounts of sake if we broke the brewing process down into three stages. And in each stage, they create a new mash, add it to the old mash, and the amount that's produced gets sequentially larger. 
The uh, brewers in Itami, uh, the ones that produced Otokoyama sake that I mentioned earlier, they're the ones who perfected these uh, techniques. But they didn't invent them. Actually, it was Buddhist monks in Nara in the late 16th century who did all these things and also introduced um, pasteurization to sake brewing. But it's the Itami brewers who made a buck off of it. And they shipped all their uh, sake to Edo. And at first, they uh, used pack animals. You had one barrel on each side of a horse. Taking it to Edo, that was too slow. They developed a special boat, a sake boat, barrel boat, to take loads of sake up or down to Edo. Uh, usually, this was a two-week two journey. But there was always a competition to see who could get the freshest sake to market. And some people could manage to get to Edo in just three days if the winds were favorable. Hiroshige's print of the battle between sweets and sake participated in a long legacy of fictional debates and skirmishes between foodstuffs. Illustrated scroll of the sake and rice debate was one of the most prominent of these early examples. This picture scroll dates from the 16th century, and at least 30 surviving copies were made in the early modern period. Illustrated scroll of the sake and rice debate offers three scenes in which proponents of rice, sake, and both commodities hold forth on the virtues of their gustatory preferences. Another text, tea rice debate, is in this genre and composed around the same time as Shuhanran was created. It was uh, printed in the early modern period beginning in the 17th century. And in this example, the, t the rice and the tea are the main characters, and they describe their own virtues. These foods have come to life. And that idea that products could come to life and argue with one another was tailor-made for inexpensive comic books, the kibyoshi, that flourished from the late last decades of the 18th century to the turn of the 19th century. Noted author of the comic travel tale Shanksmare, Jipensha Iku, wrote one such comic book titled Epic Clash Between Rice Cakes and Sake. Hiroshige went on to create other uh, prints in this vein. He contributed further to this fantasy food battle by creating a sequel to his first triptych. Unfortunately, I couldn't find an image of this. Uh, but this time, he has a battle not fought between sweets and sake, but fought by their surrogates, tea and the vessels used to serve it, and seafood which is a traditional accompaniment. His triptych is called Reinforcements in the Battle of Rice Cakes and Sake, printed in 1843 or 1846, and it makes a visual pun in the Japanese characters used to write the title, which can also be translated as part two of the best sale in the wonderful world of sake and rice cakes. But the most ignoted example appears about a decade later, in 1859, by Hiroshige's disciple, Utagawa Hirokage. He created one of his most famous works, a triptych woodblock print, epic battle between the armies of produce and fish. It depicts waves crashing on a beach as an advancing army of seafood-headed warriors meets an enemy force of vegetable samurai who hold the shore. Culinary historian Matsushita Sachiko contends that the triptych is the artist's response to a cholera epidemic that swept Japan at that time. She argues that the vegetables appear to be winning. <laughs> and they were less acceptable, susceptible to cholera than fish. Cholera can be spread by eating contaminated food. And since vegetables were usually cooked in the early modern period, and seafood was sometimes eaten raw, as in sushi, she might have a point. But, this print is also a great opportunity for a series of wincingly bad puns, <laughs> as seen in the names provided to each of the anthropomorphized characters. A yam, Yama no Imo, becomes the warrior, Imo Yama Tohachi. Corn, Tomoro Koshi, takes on the heroic name Tomoro Koshi Nosuke, and the name Daikonoski Futamata could be translated as 
Mr. Thighs as fat as radishes. We also find in the opposites, we also find leader tangerine, mikan tayu, big tree peach noske, oki momo noske, and representing the seafood side are soldier flounder, kare heta, bluefin kojiro, hobo kojiro, and there's the, also the very mysterious sea bottom foam noske, umisoko awa noske. Actually, that's a crab. There's a catfish taro, namazu taro, and my personal favorite, blowfish saburo big stomach, fugu saburo harataka. The prints may not ward off cholera or any disease, but they can still prove their value as entertainment, as an entertaining distraction. Some of you laughed at least. <laughs> I'm amused. Contemporaneous with Hirokage's print and continuing the tradition of war tales featuring fighting commodities is the battle between sake and tobacco, dated 1857, which survives as a script from the ballad tradition of northern Japan specifically Sendai or Niigata prefectures. The anonymous manuscript colors the eternal conflict between consumables with a distinct regional flair. The lead general on the sake side is a famous brand of sake from Noto in modern Ishikawa prefecture. He confronts the most noted variety of tobacco of the age, kokubu, named for a location in Kagoshima, Kyushu. The story, and I won't bore you with it, quickly becomes a listing of famous blends of tobacco, indicating a very high level of connoisseurship for tobacco in that part of Japan. The conflict is finally resolved through the intercession of two heroes, two types of tea. They announce their names as early past, Hatsumukashi, and later past, Nochimukashi. And these are the most acclaimed brands of tea favored by the Tokugawa shoguns. The teas declare, quote, tea is like a drive shaft on a cart, and sake and tobacco are the wheels. So they establish that humanity can enjoy all these pleasures simultaneously and equally. Indeed, a main part of the humor of these skirmishes between different commodities was the very notion that they were antagonistic to one another, when they were usually enjoyed consecutively, if not simultaneously. Just a few words about tobacco right now. Um, arrived in Japan in the 1570s. Uh, many, many famous brands of tobacco. And one of the most famous was a brand of tobacco from Yoshino in Nara. Uh, the comic novelist Santo Kyoden picks up a poem about Yoshino tobacco in one of his works. He wrote a small treatise called it's a small treatise, but with a grand name. Uh, Complete Treasury on Tobacco was Kyoden's uh, name for this little pamphlet that he printed up in 1793. Really, it was just an, a, a shameless advertisement for his store where he sold tobacco containers and pipes of his own design. He attributed uh, this verse to the, public, the comic poet uh, Yusen, uh, Yuensai Teiryu, or Nagata Teiryu. If I have it in the next slide. Ah, yes. Here's Santo Kyogren, and here's our poem. It looks like clouds, the wispy smoke of Yoshino tobacco. Among the cherry blossoms, how it climbs up. Of course, i got to do it again. It looks like clouds, the wispy smoke of Yoshino tobacco. Among the cherry blossoms, how it climbs up. Besides producing excellent tobacco, Yoshino was more famous for its cherry blossoms, which the author references in the poem. Santo Kyozan, Kyoden's younger brother, expanded on many of these topics in his brother's very short, complete treasury of tobacco to give us a reason, to give us many reasons why we should smoke. And most of these are completely ridiculous, but they're fun to read. He, Kyozan, promised his readers information about how to exhale, exhale a cloud of smoke in the shape of a woman, how to cure a cavity with an old pipe, and how to become a millionaire with one 
tobacco pouch. The secret to becoming a millionaire with one tobacco pouch was to visit a small store in the Ginza in Edo, owned by his brother, Kyoden. Quote, if all the people of the 60 provinces just order one tobacco pouch, each just once in their lives, then Kyoden will become a millionaire. This is guaranteed, no mistake made. Now, Santo Kyoden was notorious for his money-making schemes and self-promotion. He frequently mentions his tobacco shop in his fiction. He even sold literacy, literacy pills to his customers. <laughs> and Kyoden provides an extreme example of the length to which shopkeepers advertise their goods. If readers of imaginative tales that featured sake battling tobacco were looking for comparable examples of commodity competitions in real life, they had only to look at the marketing techniques of merchants like Santo Kyoden, who sold these goods. In the great samurai epic, the uh, treasury of loyal retainers, the most famous tale of samurai heroics of the early modern period, soba, sake, and tobacco all play minor roles in the drama of the 47 masterless samurai seeking revenge for the death of their lord in 1702. By some accounts, the masterless samurai dined on soba and drank kenbishi sake before their famous vendetta. Santo Kyoden, he reportedly owned a pipe said to have belonged to one of these men. But beyond being supernumeraries to greater events, as my talk has shown, soba, sake, tobacco, and sweets starred in their own dramatic tales. They declaimed their virtues with erudition in stories and ballads. They postured on parody sumo fight cards. They came to blows in woodblock prints to delight early modern audiences. The artists who portrayed these consumables proved that food, drink, and tobacco were not mundane objects, but they had lives of their own, which were poetic, heroic, and potentially precarious a metaphor for the sometimes fierce competition among the sellers of these goods and for the crisis caused when these products became expensive or unavailable. The first decades of the 19th century, which saw the creation of many of the examples of the food fights described in my talk, are also noted for the famines that devastated parts of Japan, especially in the Northeast in the 1820s and 1830s, causing the price of rice to triple in Edo and demonstrating to one and all, in a severe way, how any commodity, once taken for granted, could quickly become a cause for struggle. The starving might think only of food, but in times of plenty, food and drink in their most pleasurable, refined forms, as noodles, sake, and sweets, along with tobacco, could become objects of idiosyncratic fascination as revealed in the writings Soba Encyclopedia and Soba Diary, or when these goods received human form in the verbal and visual culinary battles my talk introduced. Such narratives were compelling because ordinarily these goods were enjoyed together rather than separately. And while monomaniacal fans of smoking or soba might choose to discourse solely on their favorite comestible, the stories of sweets sake and tea and tobacco fighting each other always ended with the goods realizing that they were better living off in peace together the way that they were typically consumed. Soba shops, for example, were noted venues to drink sake in Edo, with customers using special terminology to refer to the sake that they had before their soba, during their soba, and after their soba. Comic author Santo Kyozan recommended sugar as a cure for too much tobacco, and apparently that was a common no notion during that period. And full, full tea ceremonies typically served a short meal accompanied by sake, tobacco, and sweets. Early modern, author early modern authors warn us that some foods and drinks could combine for unfavorable combinations. But other texts assert that wise consumers, even competitive eaters, could indulge their passions fully and keep any disagreements caused by eating, 
drinking and smoking too much in the realm of the imagination rather than in the depths of the stomach, where all these products were supposed to meet in a harmonious way. Thank you very much. So the last time I gave a talk, CGS, someone asked a question and totally stumped me, but it became a chapter in a book. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing your questions. Or to being stumped. You mentioned kudzu as a thickener for soba. Yeah. Is kudzu common in Japan? Oh, sure. Yeah. Very common. And what part of the plant was used as a thickener? Oh, see, now you've stumped me. <laughs> I'll have to get back on you on that. I'm, well, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Are there other culinary uses of kudzu? Are there other culinary? I'm sure we could find some. Because pe people, people made all, that's a remarkable thing about Japanese uh, dietary patterns is there's just such creativity in ways people eat foods and make use of foods that otherwise, you know, if you were to eat them in their raw form would be poisonous. Like some mountain vegetable sansai really have to be heavily processed before you eat them. And it's remarkable that people were able to figure out how to do that and consume them. So uh, your kudzu question, I'm sure there's lots of ways to eat kudzu, but usually I think it's used as a starch. Anyone know? Yes? sweets that are made from kuzu. It's called kuzu in ja Japanese. Um, that are like g gelatinous, sort of, or like almost like a gelatin yeah. kind of thing. Kuzu you? Kuzu you? And another thing on, on kuzu is that it was before sugar, it was the main sweetener, I believe. And my guess, although don't quote me on it, is that uh, it was the stem that was used for the, hmm. to get the, the uh, powder out. Because I don't think the leaves had much stuff in them. Huh. That's my guess. But anyway, kuzu was used for a sweetener, oh. right? Um, before sugar. I was gonna ask about, okay. about sugar. Yes. Uh, is what kind, what was its shape when it first came in early modern Japan? Was, was it yeah. refined? Was it, was, it, was it the kurosato kind of br brown sugar or? My, I, I don't think we know exactly, but mm -hmm. I think that the Portuguese didn't bring it all the way from Europe. They sourced it locally from China. Mm -hmm. And sugar's pretty well developed as a commodity in that period. And I believe, if memory serves, they knew, they knew quite well how to refine it so you could have white sugar. Uh, but there are lots of different varieties of sugar, aren't there? And they right. you know, uh, come in in different times and uh, different places mm -hmm. in Japan. It's a while before the Japanese learn how to refine sugar on their own. Uh, I think they start growing sugar uh, more often around the turn of the, what, around 1700. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. About leaves, you know, uh, mulberry leaves. I thought I would mention them. They're really higher, that they're, they're good to eat. Uh, the higher, higher in protein than kale. Yeah, so people make a nice mulberry tea too. And uh, that was drunk in, in Japan. Uh, Asai mentions mulberry tea. He goes on and on about mulberry tea. We, we think of him as the patron of Japanese tea, but it's really, he really talks a lot about mulberry and consuming mulberry. So just, you had me thinking about leaves. And, uh, but another question maybe? Yes, Leslie. Of Daruma, oh, you have that image yeah. of Daruma stuffing yeah. his face, right? Yeah. Um, but also just the extravagance of a lot of this, the everydayness yeah. of it, uh, you know, even though it, it's aestheticized, yeah. um, the everydayness, the, the kind of popular appeal, part of a kind of an emerging or a, a mushrooming popular culture. Mm. Um, I mean, those are just a few of the things that struck me. Um, but I, and, and of course, the, the sort of um, uh, contestatory kind of nature of this in the face of sumptuary law and things like that. I wondered, you know, I assume you're writing a book on this, right? Um, this is actually going to become an article, an article. a chapter 
in a volume about early modern Japan, okay. uh, put together by one of my senpai here at the University of oh, Michigan, great. Gary Luke. Yeah. Great. Um, so I'm wondering if you've um, thought about what are the larger <laughs> contexts that you want to use to try to understand this amazing, mm. um, you know, kind of profusion yeah. of text, of uh, visual imagery. This is where I, I use the word cuisine to differentiate food uh, for sustenance versus food for fantasy. There's lots of ways to define cuisine. It could be you know, a national cuisine or cooking methods. But how do you talk about a national cuisine before a nation? It's very difficult, except in terms of an absence. So I think of cuisine as a way of thinking about food, fantasizing about food, imagining food doing other things than just for survival. And here we have a lot of examples of that. You also find examples in the culinary writings that are published in this period. There are hundreds of them that are published. And they create these elaborate menus or elaborate dishes. And you look carefully at the menus and you see that you couldn't make this dish. You, could, you couldn't put together this banquet. It would be too expensive. The ingredients come from different seasons and different places. So it's almost like a type of, 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 not, of fiction that people are writing about food in culinary books. So I've written about that, and this is another way of tapping into that fantasy of food. Um, yes. Thank you so much for, for your great talk and um, the resources. I, I'm, I'm really fascinated by these images. Um, my question actually touches up about the background of like historical or social or economical backgrounds yes. that motivated this um, phenomenon, because not only this um, encyclopedia or the diaries about the sobas and every foods are not only the documentation but also makes makes people to encourage to eat more and then mm -hmm. participate more in this com like competition so I'm wondering if I mean it's probably <laughs> coming from my lack of knowledge of this period specifically but mm. I wonder if you can adopt more information about what motivated people to make the documents or what motivated mm. people to eat more in front of other people in mm. the public that's a hard question. What motivates people to do that today? <laughs> people like Kobayashi stuffing his face with hot dogs. Money? 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 Fame? Social media? Social media? Street cred? I mean, all these sorts of things that uh, potentially would... It's, it's, very, it's very hard, I think, uh, to get inside the interiority of people and know what their motivations are as a historian. I, I have to look at something after the fact and look at the documents and read those and getting at that interiority is very difficult. But we can draw some conclusions, uh, not just for one genre, but lots of different genres. It seems like it's a, a popular theme in early modern culture, uh, this competition of, of eating and of foods. So I think maybe becoming a competitive eater is just a logical extension of that, uh, trying it out for yourself, seeing how many bowls of soba one could polish off. Although I don't recommend that. Um, but thank you for your question. It's, it's a very good one. I'll have to think more about it. Hi, Eric. Thank you so much. This is really engaging. Um, thank you. I was wondering, um, since you're writing this as a chapter for a book on early modernity, whether you could explicate what this teaches us about early modernity as a concept. Yeah. Um, and so it seems that some of the themes are branding, advertising, mm. Uh, consumption, obviously, yeah. uh, but I wonder whether you know behind all this rhetoric of debates and battlefields, there's also some uh, concern with economics and thinking about price and value, um, and maybe the pricing of cuisine as mm. opposed to to food, mm. right? that it's the complexity of food and the, mm. the sort of justification for the pricing of, yeah. of branding uh, that is behind this. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. And one way I could respond to that is to say, well, that's what the other chapters are supposed to do. Because uh, this is a multi-volume work, and I'm just supposed to contribute something about food. But I think you break, make some very good points. About pricing, it's kind of hit or miss. You know, you have these dictionaries for Edo period prices, and you look up a commodity, and you might find it for one year, uh, but it might shoot up the next year, and then down, and then you'll have a huge gap. 
And then how do you compare that to another commodity for, data, for you, lack, uh, you lack the data sets for? Uh, but you can definitely say that there is uh, heightened consumerism in this period. And my idea in writing this essay, just to be between us guys, is <laughs> to write something that hopefully undergraduates will want to read. Because I've been assigned you know, those thick books of essays on the early modern period, and I wanted to, there to be one essay, hopefully mine, that will stand out <laughs> and be entertaining, and people kind of have a takeaway and go, oh, I know a little bit about modern Japan. If I turn on the TV in modern Japan, gosh, cooking shows are on all the time. And then there's Iron Chef, and of course we all love Kobayashi, the competitive eater. So maybe this provides some sort of historical context for that. Um, but yes, you, one, I, I think uh, if it were a different context for this piece, then it would require much more contextualization, as, as both of you have said. But uh, for the present, I'm just having fun with food. Hello. Over here. Oh, hi. <laughs> so first of all, I, I really was being called up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. And uh, my question was about the transition between the early modern and what came after. Yeah. And whether the rapid change in the, uh, the mid-19th century uh, corresponded to rapid changes in the gastronomy and the food culture. Generally speaking? Generally. Uh, yeah, in Japan, generally speaking. Well, I think the same sort of trends continue in the visual culture. Uh, like with the, uh, Hiroshi, uh, Hirokage, the example of the fish in the, he's rather late, he's 1850s. And there are similar works done in Meiji. So you do see a continuity, it doesn't end overnight. In terms of what's happening larger in food ways, well, then there's introduction of Western foods. And those become very popular among the elite the court, for example, switches from Japanese food to French when they entertain foreign diplomats. And it takes a while for that to trickle down. It's not until the first couple decades of the 20th century, from what I understand, that things like, oh, croquettes, croque, uh, become more popular. And that's through the work of food writers like Murai Gensai, who writes a wonderful food novel that has some 600 recipes in it which is first serialized as a newspaper a column, uh, but it helps popularize all these Western foods. Some of them make it, some of them don't, but it shows a growing interest in Western cuisine and a willingness to you know, take it in. But I think uh, it's been argued that the modern period, rather than being a full-scale shift from a Western diet, it's more like a, uh, the urban diet spreads out more to rural areas. It takes a while. Because indeed, in the 1920s and 1930s, people are eating a lot in, like they did in the 19th century in rural period, in rural parts of Japan. Uh, so there's lots of things going on. It's a very fascinating period. You should study that period. <laughs> Thank you. Can I ask? Yes. Eric, um, uh, you know, as <clears throat> my voice is terrible. As 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 historians, mm. we try not to say Japan was unique. <laughs> So my question is that, uh, uh, is this, is this uh, unique to Japan? That's why mm, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I had to ask this way. But I yeah. see it really as an Edo phenomenon. I see. And not, I can't imagine people in Kyoto eating as much as people in Edo or something like that. And then yeah. those regional kinds of food mm. that do travel, I suppose, but mm. not, they aren't. Uh, present in the same way in different regions. Mm. So instead of thinking of this as a uniquely Japanese, you know, I, no. I would hate to say that anyway, but this seems, like, that. Yeah, <laughs> this, this seems like a uniquely Edo phenomenon mm. and has a lot to do with the concentration of people mm. in Edo uh, with sunken kota and that mm. kind of stuff and just the demographic factor and so on. So I wonder... Uh, if you have comparison with other countries too, uh, so when you talk about uniqueness or non-unique. Right. I, I was initially when I started looking at the Edo period food Edo period foodways, I was very inspired by the uh, sociologist of France at Columbia University, uh, Priscilla Parkhurst Ferguson, mm -hmm. and her work on uh, French cuisine. Mm -hmm. And she argues that really what makes French cuisine a national cuisine is publications, mm -hmm. writings about 
uh, French cuisine. Mm -hmm. And you do see very imaginative things in French cuisine. Names of dishes, for example, that make no sense, but they sound nice. You know, people will give a name uh, for a dish, and I'm not going to try any French out, but uh, people give a name for a dish, and it's just purely made up. So there's a similar sort of playfulness with food, and it gets disseminated through the media in a similar way. This is at a lower level, I think. It's wood block prints. It's those bonds of okay. I mean, A lot of them do come from Edo, but the tobacco battle, that is from the north. The brewing center is not in Edo. It's in Osaka, Kobe region. So you could say it's an urban phenomenon, perhaps. That, that, uh, that argument could be made. Uh, but it is heavily rooted in Edo, I agree with you, and not uniquely Japanese. No. I would never say such a thing. Yes, Leslie? Um, just one thing, pulling a couple things together. Yes. Um, you know, the economic kind of setting for mm -hmm. this, your mention of famines uh, in the early 19th century. Um, you know, I remember reading in one of Brett Walker's articles, and I'm sure he's drawing from Japanese historians of early modern, um, that what's happening in the 18th century, I mean, there, what the trend in the 18th century is as urban populations have grown, mm. um, particularly in Edo and then the Kansai region, the countryside gets turned into sort of extractive economies, mm. um, you know, producing primary food stuff often mm. that can't be used as is, like soybeans mm. or, um, and, to, and to supply the cities, mm. and that becomes the cause for, or at least one of the causes, mm. for some of these horrific famines, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in northern Japan. Yes. But um, at the same time, what's happening around the cities is they are converting more and more of the land around the cities to produce, um, what can I say, uh, secondary food stuff uh -huh. or, or textiles yeah. Yeah. or the kinds of things that are increasingly being consumed by a rising you know, towns, townsman right. class. So maybe that's one of the connections between um, I don't know what this Japanese historian was saying, you mm. know, pre precisely was saying. Maybe that's one of the connections between <coughs> famine and this kind of, um, so it's not a direct connection. Um, right, right. But it's a yeah. connection nonetheless. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm fascinated. I've written about urban farming in Japan, and it develops in that period, 17th century, as a way to supply specifically vegetables and then using night soil fertilizer. So this, it's a very interesting phenomenon. We have to stop. We have to, st we have to stop very soon, but if there's one more question maybe, a short one. If not, we should stop and vacate the room for the next class to move in, I guess. Right. Yeah, so let's thank Professor Rath. Thank you.